Good morning, everyone. What a rousing welcome from Tom and from our choir. I want to welcome you to worship here at the United Church of Dorset and East Rupert. I remember last Sunday I welcomed you to springtime. Welcome back to winter. But regardless of the season, we are warmed by the community of this love and faith, and that's the best greeting we can share. Let's turn to those sitting nearby and pass the love and peace of the Lord. We are in a great mood. I can't understand why. Let me share a few announcements to bring us together even more closely as a community. Uh, we want to thank in advance our acolyte this morning, Dan Zimmerman, and our beetle is Paula Nassavera. We want to thank you in advance, Sean Bottoms, for being our lay scripture reader for later in the service. Likewise, thanksgiving to Walker May, who is our worship technician in the balcony. And we are blessed this morning with lovely flowers Thanks to Andy and Ginny Longacre for the glory of springtime, which will sometime get here. Uh, for the family of affection and faith, we want you to know the sad news that Dick Hittle passed away Friday afternoon at the age of 99. So there are new COVID guidelines. Number one, masks will no longer be mandated. They will be by individual discretion. You can clap if you want. <laughs> Singing will be allowed with or without masks. Small groups may gather again and even eat together. Coffee hour will return on Easter. Uh, we are still asking that vaccinations and boosters be required. And if you are sick, stay home and let me know and I'll bring you soup. <laughs> All right, other announcements. It's time to order lilies for Easter and uh, call or contact the office for your order. We are recruiting for our Good Friday Seven Last Words service. Uh, homilists, preachers of small mini sermons, uh, to be a part of that lovely and traditional service. And if you would like to uh, venture forth with that, uh, I would love to invite you and give you uh, the details. Uh, one great hour of sharing offering, one of the key ones in our year long of, of collections, uh, will take place Sunday, April 10th. Uh, the green team is continually uh, encouraging meatless Mondays, and you will see the latest recipe from Kate in the bulletin. Uh, this afternoon at 4 on Zoom, we are having a, uh, a lecture and a question and answer opportunity on uh, the invasion of Ukraine and you will see the contact information in the bulletin. Uh, and don't forget the ID number and the passcode uh, name. Uh, Al Lindsay is our newly elected member at large. So if you have any complaints about the church, <laughs> heave them Al's way. He will also take compliments, too, won't you? Yeah. Um, and after worship this morning, the confirmation class will be meeting with me over at the manse. And uh, this morning, Jane is with them on their monthly field trip. And this month, they are visiting the Russian Orthodox Monastery at Newskeet. Are there any other announcements for the good of the body this morning? We're excited to have a birthday in our home this week. 
Sophia will be eight years old, and we can't wait for our church family to sing to her. Oh, good. So go ahead and sing. Tell her to stand on the seat. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, Sophia. Happy birthday to you. Yeah, that's important. Thank you very much. Any other announcements? I don't want to miss any birthdays. You'll talk to Al Lindsay very quickly if I, if I do. <laughs> so friends, let's join our hearts and our minds and our souls as we worship God this day. Dan, Paula, help us begin. Friends, shall we call one another to worship our God? Jesus makes us a promise. I will never abandon you as orphans. I will not vanish from your sight. Worship with the knowledge that you do not travel alone. As we feel God's presence among us, let us worship God. Let's sing our opening hymn. It is number 200. We're singing verses 1 and 3 of What a Wondrous Love is This. Friends, let's further enter the spirit and order of our worship by sharing the unison prayer of confession, as we find it in the bulletin. The Lord be with you. And also with you. We are good at rules, making them and breaking them. We are reminded that when we gain Jesus as our Lord and Savior, we received exactly what we need forgiveness, grace, and hope. Let us confess our sins to God 
that we might know God's healing love for us. Let us pray together. If we were to name all the gods we have before you, rock of redemption, we would be here a very long time. We elevate politicians into saviors, though they are as broken as we are. We misuse your name so much during the day, we have trouble speaking to you in prayer at night. We are so busy, we do not notice how creation witnesses to your goodness and grace. Forgive us, God, our hope. Help us to let go of what we value most so that we may open our emptiness, our hearts, our lives to the healing and loving presence of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Let's take a moment of silence for our own personal confession. Friends, the point of confession is not to make us feel condemned. It is to embrace the gift of God's love and forgiveness. Let's share the assurance. Persistently, patiently, lovingly, God pours out grace and joy into our lives, healing our brokenness, forgiving our sin. Loved, we are sent to love. Forgiven, we are freed to forgive. Graced, we offer our gifts to everyone we meet. Thanks be to God. Amen. Now I call on Dan to lead us this morning in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. invite the adults to be seated, but I would love a moment with my, my friends, my Sunday school buddies on the steps. Good morning, my three friends. How are you doing? Good, good. So come on over, close to me. You're right up here. And for the first time in a long time, you guys look different. How come? I don't know. You don't know? We're all different, that's true. But we're missing something we're often wearing. Clothes. No, not clothes. <laughs> no, no, you got you you came fully dressed. Yeah, this thing. The masks. So I want to talk about the masks because uh, now we don't have to wear them when we come to church. You can, if you want, do whatever makes you feel safe, okay? Uh, but I was curious, we have been wearing these masks a long time. A thousand years. 80,000. Yeah, a long time. So, I want to know how that felt. 
How does it feel to wear the masks? I don't really like the masks. What's that? I don't really like masks. You don't like them? Well, you like to keep them off. Weston? I like it. There you are. I see you now. You do? The shorter one you like better? So how did, Weston, how did you feel wearing masks? Alden, how did you feel? You felt fine. Okay. Well, okay, here's the next question. How did you feel when you took the masks off? Very good. Yeah. Number one. You felt like number one. Well, I'll tell you, when I take my mask off, first of all, I feel like I can breathe again. Yeah. <laughs> it's so nice to feel the freedom of fresh air, yeah. isn't it? You did? Oh, wow. Anyway, I just want us to know that, uh, first of all, masks, we can wear when we feel uh, like we need to, to feel safe. But here in church right now, we can uh, not wear them if it's okay with folks and with each of us. But whatever we're wearing, masks or not, I just want us to know that God sees us and God loves us. And that there's no hiding from God. There's no hiding from God. God sees us and loves us always, masks or no masks. So let us pray. We thank you for all of the carefulness that we have practiced over these last two years, including wearing masks. It has kept us healthy and safe. But it is so nice, so nice to take the masks off. But still, Lord, help us to stay safe. And help us to know that you always watch us and follow us on the journey of life. There is no hiding from you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. Have a good day at Sunday school. We'll see you later.
I would remind us that biblically speaking, another word for God's mercy is God's compassion. So in peace, let us pray to the Lord saying, Lord, have mercy. O oh God, our creator, help us to be silent before you and to know that you are God. We come asking your help in teaching us how to pray. How do we as partners of a peace and peacemaking church pray for our world in a time of war? Words fail us, O oh God. Help us to accept that there are events over which we have little or no control. And may we know again that you call each of us to be faithful servants of your compassion and peace. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. We pray for this church and the church throughout the world that all who follow Christ may embody the reconciling love of Christ. And may we unite with all fellowships of faithful people of differing faiths and backgrounds in seeking your will and your purpose in our daily lives. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. We pray for the peoples and nations of the world and their leaders. We pray for a change of heart by Vladimir Putin and the Russian military leadership that they may halt their death-dealing destruction in Ukraine. And our prayers are especially with the citizens of Mariupol, without food, water, heat, and medicine in that devastated and besieged city, that relief supplies may reach them. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. We pray, O oh God, for all efforts around the world to provide humanitarian aid, as well as military support to Ukraine, to those who are resisting the invasion of their land, and for the many refugees from the war. We pray for our enemies, that we may reach across the divisions between us, be with the families of all soldiers and all civilians killed and wounded. And our prayers are with the courageous war resistors in Russia. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. We pray, O oh God, for the planet Earth your gift to all creation and to humankind, that all may share wisely in its resources and may conserve its riches for our children's children. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Our prayers of thanksgiving this week are with Judge Kentanji Brown Jackson as she weathered and persevered with grace the Senate Judiciary Committee, Committee hearings. And we honor the life and work of Madeleine Albright, the first woman to serve as our Secretary of State, who died this past Wednesday. In this Women's History Month, we give thanks for these and for so many other pioneering women of the past and the present. May we awaken to the life and energies of the feminine part of life that is within each of us, in our society and in our world. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. 
We lift before you, O God, those on this church's immediate needs list. Our prayers are with the Reverend Marion Pete McCart, with Anne Healy, with Stephanie and Stephen Blake, with Ken and Carol Shippey, with Jean, with Tony Ann Pearsall, with Deb Sharp, with Shelley Krause, with Bentley Lewis, with Hazel Prouty. Our prayers are with Bob West, with Linda Sargent, with Matthew Hill, with Gary Wilkins, with Sophia, with Mary Sandra Senecal, with Linda Drunsick, with Dan Pinsono. We pray for Gary Dufour, for Chip Wilson, for John S., for Joe Crawford, for Terry Archard, for Amber Lundberg, for Sandy Carey, for Ronald Lamb, for David Parsons. We pray for Theron Trumley, for Peter Salmon, who has heart valve replacement this week, for Margaret Viglucci, for Martha Bowen, for Noemi, for Elizabeth LaBerge, for Alana Badgley, for Rudy Green, for Johnny D, for Ellen Waldman, for Loretta and Ted Melhado, for Bob Slevin, and we pray for two of our Afghan families, Nawidullah Yar and Mustafa Yar, who are young people still stuck in Kabul. And we pray for Chase Berkheimer, a little boy facing cancer. Our prayers are with Loretta and Ted Melhado, and with the friends and family of Dick Hiddle, Dick Hiddle who died on Friday, surrounded by loved ones. In the Dorset Church, our prayers are for the capital campaign as they near completion. And in the Vermont Conference, for the pastor and congregation of Grace Congregational Church in Rutland. And in the United Church of Christ, we pray for the churches in Poland who are receiving and caring for the nearly two million refugees that have come into Poland from Ukraine. It's mostly women and children as the men have stayed behind to defend their homeland. O oh, loving God, hear the prayers of your people for the sake of our world. And we pray in the name of Jesus who brought healing to those in need. Amen. Our hymn is number 199, When Jesus Wept. Are you ready for a challenge? This is a round, and I would like us to sing it as a round. And the way I want to do that is first have us all sing it together as a congregation, and then the bride side of the church will lead us off. And when the bride side gets to where you see the number two, then the groom side continues, and we'll sing it two verses that way. See you at the end.
so I call on Sean. I'm so thankful that Sean, being on break from Williams College, was willing to uh, help us this morning by reading scripture. Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you know me, you know the Father. Henceforth, you know him and see him. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 9. For now, we know only partially, but when wholeness and perfection is ours, the partial will end. When I was a child, I spoke, reasoned, and thought like a child. When I matured, I put an end to childish ways. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part, but someday I will be fully known. Genesis chapter 32, verse 24. Jacob was left alone, and a man came and wrestled with him all night long till daybreak. When the man saw that he couldn't prevail against Jacob, he struck him on the hip socket, and Jacob's hip came out of joint. Then the man said, Now let me go, for the new day is breaking. But Jacob said, Not until you bless me. So the man said, What is your name? And he said, Jacob. Then the man said, You are no longer named Jacob, but you are named Israel. For you have battled with God and with humans and have survived. So Jacob called this place Peniel, for I have seen God face to face and lived. Thanks, Sean, for the words that undergird my sermon entitled, Face to Face at Last. But before I preach, let us pray. O God of love, O God of truth, Let us say strong things gently and gentle things strongly. Let us speak the truth in love to all and love the truth that lives in each. Let us hear the truth as we each need it and live that truth. O God, we heed it through Jesus, your word, and our Lord. Amen. So ever since uh, a number of the Vermont schools lifted the mask mandate, I've heard a number of cute stories about seeing whole faces once again. So there's the story of the middle school girl who surprised everyone when she took off her mask and people suddenly realized She'd gotten her braces off sometime during the last two years. What a lovely smile you have, so many people told her. And she started to walk down the hallways with greater pride and confidence. Then there were the numerous stories about the high school boys who over the last two years had matured into young men Off came the masks to reveal their faces had elongated and now were sporting mustaches. Suddenly makeup mattered, smiles mattered, shaving mattered, whole faces mattered. Psychology tells us our faces are our main advertisement for our identity. They identify to the public the person we think we are or wish we were. There wouldn't be a billion dollar business called Facebook if that weren't true. (laughs) But friends, the psychology of faces goes deeper than that. Faces have a soulful impact, newborns, need faces to be their mirrors for life. 
It is well proven that babies rely on regular and close face contact to learn from, to mimic, to receive their first messages of love and security and joy. When those little fingers reach up to touch your face and poke you, your nose and poke your eyes and play with your jewelry and your glasses, they are schooling themselves in life and your face is their touch screen. Child experts are wondering how COVID babies will be affected over the last two years of mask wearing. But I think we should all ask ourselves, what messages about life do we send through our faces? Joy, peace, understanding, compassion, or depression, anger, stiffness, complacency, But this morning I'm talking beyond the physical face. Talking about the phrase face to face, which is one of the most important and complex spiritual notions in the scriptures. Indeed, one of my favorite seminary professors believed that a baby's first experience of God is determined by the faces that he or she sees. And this is a lifelong determination. In fact, he says, he defines our relationship with God as the face that never goes away. Then there is what Raymond Moody reveals in his book, Life After Life, shares hundreds of near-death stories, and many testify to a face-to-face -face experience with their past life on earth, as though they are moving in front of a movie screen and being confronted with all the bad and good of their behaviors. All of that makes sense given the Hebrew theology of faces. Faces are much, much more than just a physical surface. It is a window into the human soul. It is an expression of the divine that lives within us. In that wonderful story in Exodus 34, Moses is coming down from Mount Sinai with the Ten Commandments. And it reads, Moses did not realize that the skin on his face was radiant because he had been talking to God. Likewise, they believed that seeing the face of God was so holy, so awesome and powerful, that the human soul could not stand it and would die. Earlier in Exodus, Moses wants to see God face to face, but God says, no one shall see me face to face and live, but I will put you in that cleft in the rock, and when I pass by, I'll cover your eyes, and you will only see me in hindsight. So this morning's story about Jacob is really a big change in that. It's a story about one fateful night when he starts out all alone and then this mystery man appears and begins to wrestle with him. All night long, back and forth, they wrestle. And neither is able to defeat the other. But the mystery man wounds Jacob. But in the end, Jacob survives, and the mystery man blesses him with a new identity, represented by a new name, Israel. And to memorialize this battleground, Jacob names the place Peniel, which means the face of God, because as the story goes, 
he saw God face to face and lived. So some say that Jacob was wrestling with an angel. But a more intriguing take is that he wrestled with himself. He wrestled with the dark side of himself. That side that wounds a person. The side with which many people wrestle all their lives. And if they're lucky, they become blessed. Blessed with a new identity and not just a beat up old one. And so seeing God face to face means seeing the truth in yourself. It means seeing yourself in divine honesty, like a man or woman standing before the mirror of God. And in a way, Jacob did die when he faced God. His old self was no more, but a new self replaced it. And many's the testimony of AA from long timers who have enjoyed sobriety for decades, and their story sounds a lot like Jacob's. I believe when Jesus made his great declaration of self-identity, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to God except through me. If you see me, you see the Father. Essentially, he sees himself as the mirror of God. To us, for us to picture what divine humanity might look like, but also to reflect to us the truth of our own humanity. Through Jesus, we are able to have a sacred face-to-face encounter. Paul celebrates this face-to-face encounter. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part, but someday I will be fully known. He likens it to spiritual maturity. He calls it an experience of the perfect. He says it is the be-all and end-all of life. But to get to this face-to-face miracle, he suggests we must remove three different kinds of masks. And the first kind is suggested here. If I speak with the eloquence of angels, if I am known for my prophetic powers, my great knowledge, my vast generosity, so that I may boast, but have not love, I am nothing. To have a truly sacred, a truly transformative face-to-face experience, we must take off the mask of our public persona. There are many who are raised to live by what the public thinks of them. Their personal identity is profoundly tethered to their public identity. And to boast is to live, and to live is to boast. Right now, many American high school seniors are absorbed in this frantic search for college, and American colleges are absorbed in the frantic search for students. And frankly, when I think about that list that Paul enumerates, eloquence, knowledge, generosity, future insight, It sounds like the ideal college application, which only shows us how hard it is to unmask ourselves from the public persona. Our whole culture is geared for it. One pastoral counselor noted, we put more time and energy and devotion into creating lives that sound like great resumes instead of living real lives of love and faith and hope. 
A second unmasking is suggested here. When I was a child, I spoke like a child, reasoned like a child, thought like a child. When I matured as an adult, I gave up my childish ways. The second unmasking is that of our childhoods. Now immediately we could hail back to Paul's famous list of those great qualities of love. And we might say that being childish means being impatient and unkind and envious or boastful or arrogant or rude or insisting on our own way or holding resentments or just being irritable. But taking off the mask of our childhoods goes deeper than that. It means giving up the logic that governed our childhood, simplistic, literalistic thinking. It means no longer letting our parents control our lives with guilt or money or authority. It means no longer letting our childhood wounds govern our adult agenda. It means being liberated from those childhood needs our parents didn't fulfill and no longer harboring resentment for what was stolen from us during childhood. Instead, it means coming face to face with ourself, just like Jacob wrestled with himself and in the end, standing on our own two legs with a whole new identity. The third unmasking is suggested here. For we only know in part, and we can only see the future in part, but when the complete comes, the partial will end. This is the unmasking of false completion. It is a great act of humility to say, I only know in part, I only see in part. Because in this present culture of ours, how many talk as if they know it all? That they are done changing, they are complete, a finished product perfect as they are, don't mess with them and don't try to change their ideas. When I hear something like that in nursing homes, I say to myself, it sounds as though they are on their way through the valley of the shadow of death. And so I want to end with a story about a dear lady that some of you may remember named Zaid Boyce. A woman who for a long time never wore the mask of false completion. For many years she lived at Equinox Terrace and she would devotedly come to our worship services, that is when she wasn't out and about town, with friends at the library book club, playing bridge, going out to eat, visiting museums or antique shops or just going for walks. She had no blood family, but her friends became her family. And Zaid, dear Zaid, was honest and upbeat, a great storyteller and an even better story listener. Her joie de vivre was so contagious it was always a gift for me to visit her more than the other way around. Now, perhaps this stellar mood and attitude was a part of her natural spiritual makeup, but I also know she worked at it. She was constantly learning a new language. She vowed every single year to make a new friend under the age of 50. She was always open-minded to new ideas. Zaid never wore the mask of false completion. But more than that, 
she gave witness to the greatest truth of all about faces. That it's not about the physical. It's about the spiritual. Totally about the spiritual. Because you see, Zaid's physical face was deformed. It was deformed, I think, from a bout of cancer early in life. At any way, she had a crooked nose. She had sunken in cheeks. And yet, the outside of her face was barely something you ever noticed. Because her true being was so completely expressed by her radiant personality and that amazing loving spirit. Everyone, everyone who knew her called her beautiful. Amen. As we come to our time of offering, <clears throat> we, the offering plates are still located on the small tables in the back as we enter or exit. Um, <clears throat> and I would like to call our attention along with the announcements. We have had a brief stewardship note in bulletins. And today's bulletin says, next to welcoming spring, says stewardship is love in action. Our stewardship of our giving uh, through the church and in many ways is one of the ways that love is in action. And we say that as people of the new creation, we offer ourselves and our gifts to God. Let us join in singing the doxology. Let us pray. O oh God, all that we have comes from you. Receive our offering and with it the offering of our lives, for we would return to you what you have so graciously given. And use us, we pray, for the sake of Christ, in whose name we offer these prayers. Amen. Our closing hymn is number 207. We will sing verses 1, 3, and 4 of In the Cross of Christ I Glory, 207.
Now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with each and every one of us today and forevermore. Amen.